Well, good morning. I'm Pastor Chris Myros of Glory Baptist Church. Thanks for stopping in and joining us for worship this morning with our series of Church at Home. I'm going to give you a little bit of information and uh, read a little bit of scripture, offer some prayers, and then we're going to hop into the sermon. A uh, couple of quick informational items. Earlier this week, we sent out uh, either an email or we gave a call to a number of people about the comfort level that people will have at coming back to church. Uh, prior to yesterday, we were at a 25% of capacity threshold. The great news is uh, Minnesota is allowing us to move up to 50% of capacity as our threshold, which helps our processes out quite a bit. Uh, we are going to be meeting on June 18th as a leadership team of the church. The church council will be gathering. And uh, at that point, I, I suspect we will make a decision and set a date for our return to, to, to meeting in person. Uh, we will continue to provide worship resources online as well, but that kind of gives us a, a better picture of what we can do and, and how to go about doing it. But the part we don't know is people's comfort level in, in returning yet and joining together physically in person. And so if you would fill out that survey, that gives us at least some data to work with that we will be more informed and be able to make better decisions. So do please fill that out if you haven't done so already. A couple other informational items. Uh, if you would like to give online, we have online giving for Glory Baptist Church. Easiest way to do that is just go to our church's website, aitkinchurch.com, A-I-T-K-I-N, church.com. And in the top right-hand corner, if you're looking at it on a web browser on a computer, otherwise there's kind of looks like a, almost like a hamburger bun, sandwich, three-line thing. Uh, if you click on that, it'll give you a drop-down box on a phone or iPad, things like that. And then just click on Give. It's a safe, secure system for giving. <clears throat> you can set up an account for ongoing gifts, or you can give one-time gifts, whatever you would like to do. And, and that's an easy way to give to the work and efforts of Glory Baptist Church. You can, of course, continue to mail them in or drop them off at church for your tithes and offerings. And we do thank you for your support. All kinds of ministries continue to <clears throat> excuse me, take place um, because of your generosity, and so we are thankful for that. Uh, on that note, our missions team had an emergency meeting this past week and have uh, specified monies out of our missions budget going to the Twin Cities for some of the recovery efforts from the protesting and rioting and, and the destruction that happened there. Uh, there's two different ministries that we are partnering with. Um, one's a, a church that's in the immediate area of where all of those things happened. Uh, Jubilee Church, Matt and Katie Nix have a connection uh, from being part of that church in the past. And so uh, their hands and feet are on the ground in that neighborhood and supporting some ministry through them, as well as one of our sister churches, uh, Converged Church, uh, Bethlehem Baptist Church has an outreach um, or a branch of their ministry that we are sending some money to as well. If you would like to partner with that or, or be part of the work that's going on down there and you don't know how to do that, <clears throat> a great resource is called Transform Minnesota. And you can find them on Facebook. You can find them on their webpage online. Uh, Carl Nelson is a friend of mine who heads that ministry. And, and it's a very, very reputable, very good quality ministry that's been doing a lot of work uh, in this area prior to this time. And so they continue uh, really leading the way. Converge North Central has done a lot of partnering with Transform Minnesota. And so uh, I heartily recommend to you to connect with them. He's, they have an ongoing list of service opportunities if you'd like to serve in person and other ways that you can give uh, to support the recovery efforts there in the Twin Cities. And so all of that's there and, and available for you if you'd like to know more. Uh, the other thing is, if you are one of our folks, as many are, who like the Our Daily Bread devotionals, um, our order for June, July, August versions has not arrived and is not actually going to be in for a little while yet. Um, Trish called them and they're not available yet. And so um, we will get them out as soon as we get them. And they are hoping to have them to us by the end of June. So that means in the meantime, if you really want the Our Daily Bread, you can get that online. Otherwise, uh, in the meantime, you may have to use some other form for your devotional. And uh, as I said, we will get those to you as soon as we possibly can. Well, uh, in our daily or in our weekly call to prayer that you do find in our church bulletin, which is also on the church's website, 
Um, it's got a list of different things to pray for. It's got a, a verse of the week. Our family of the week is Charles and Vivian Rice. Uh, lift them up in prayer and keep praying for them. Uh, we've got a couple of expecting mothers in our church family, an extended church family. Continue to pray for those ladies and their families. Um, we've got a lot of people with various ongoing health concerns, uh, whether it's recovering from heart surgeries or, or ongoing cancer treatments. And um, uh, we're going to pray this week. would ask you to be in prayer for Naomi Backstrom this week. She's having um, surgery Wednesday, June 10th. Pray for people who, who are having you know, ongoing health issues. Uh, Shar Espetseth was uh, admitted into the hospital for some testing. Um, pray for for all the other folks who, who have various ongoing illnesses that, that have been problematic in this season. Um, continue to lift them up. And, and there's a number of those listed in, in the bulletin under the call to prayer. Continue to pray just for peace, for mercy, for justice, for wisdom. Pray for the leaders uh, of our nation, of our state, of our municipality here locally in Aiken, our county, and all the other leaders have continuing to have difficult decisions and um, it's, it's a tough time to be in leadership and just would encourage you, this is not about politics in any way, shape, or form. I don't care if you agree or disagree with somebody's politics, you can still pray for them. And so would encourage you uh, to do that. Pray for the leadership of the church. As I said, we're going to meet in a June 18th and, and pray for us to have wisdom and guidance that we might honor God in all that we do and that we might make the best decisions possible to continue moving forward as a church. And then pray for our missionaries. Uh, the number of them have been greatly impacted. We've got word from uh, Dave and April Cousins um, and, and some of their challenges that are going on currently with uh, their financial support. And there's some information about that in the call to prayer. And if you'd like to know more, um, you can contact Ruth Eggstead and, and she could tell you more about that on the specifics level and then put you in contact with them. If you don't know how to contact them, uh, contact Ruth and, and she will help you get all of that set up. But our missions partners all across the globe, whether it's uh, Pastor Aunt Martin Chikuku and his wife Anne in, in Kenya or the ministries um, in Ukraine and others just around the globe that, that COVID-19 has impacted them as much or, or more than it has us here in America. So continue to keep them in prayer. Uh, that, that would be my encouragement to you. So with that, I'm going to offer up some prayer, and then I'm going to actually read our verse for the week, and then we are going to jump into the sermon. Would you join me in prayer? Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your blessing. We thank you for your love. We thank you for all that you have given us. You are the good gift giver, and, and we rejoice and are glad in that, that uh, you know so much and provide so much for us, that uh, we are humbled and amazed that your blessing would be bestowed upon us. And God, we do pray for the world, that there's much in this world that's not as you intended it to be. You created the world and it was good, but then through mankind, uh, we sinned and sin entered in and it broke the world. And we continue to live with the effects of that brokenness. And so God, we just pray for your healing. And God, we pray for your guidance and your wisdom. We pray that we as the people of Christ would be ambassadors, that we would share your love and that we would be great representatives of of what you teach us through your word and that we might carry that wherever you would send us and, and that people would see that and, and, and would know that you are good and you are to be honored and praised. God, we pray for all who are hurting emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually, financially. God, we just continue to pray for your work that as you work in these various situations that truly uh, we would see your presence and then it, it would be to your glory that we would be able to say that it was only you who was able to do this healing or provide for this need or whatever it might be. God, we continue to pray for all of the leadership at every level, our church, our, our region, our nation, the world. Um, just pray for your guidance and wisdom in, in all of the situations across the globe, Lord. And God, we just again thank you that even though we're not together physically in this moment, that nonetheless we are the church, we are the called people. And uh, God, you've given us much that we can do. And so may we take those tasks seriously. May we love and serve our neighbor as we love ourselves. And may we indeed make a difference to your glory, honor, and praise. That is our prayer, God. 
in all that we do, may we bring you glory, honor, and praise. As we continue forward in this time of worship, may your Holy Spirit dwell upon us, among us, and through us. We praise you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, with that, would like to read for you uh, our verse of the week. It's 1 Chronicles 29, 10 through 13. And this is David praying in the assembly, and it says, Therefore David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. Amen. Well, your sermon today is going to be from a friend of mine. His name is Zach Marino. Zach was the youth pastor at Christ Community Church in Waseca, Minnesota, where I was also uh, in Waseca at the same time Zach was there. And so I got to know Zach real well there. Zach and his wife and children now live down in Maple Grove. And um, Zach is a, an accomplished preacher and teacher. Uh, he was one of the featured speakers at Trout Lake Camp last summer. And so um, maybe even some of our students have had the opportunity to see Zach uh, teach and preach before. But nonetheless, uh, we're excited to share Zach's message with you. And I look forward to coming back next week and, and continuing on in the book of Genesis. But in the meantime, uh, we have Zach here. And so I hope you enjoy it. And I hope you have an awesome week. Uh, I'm praying for you. And uh, as I always like to say, uh, and I'm not going to be able to say it at the end of the message today. So wash your hands frequently. Make much of Jesus always. Stay awesome. And at the end of this, go and serve your king. I look forward to seeing you soon. God bless. Call to separate. Now I want to look at our passage, Romans chapter 12. And we're going to look really just uh, at verse 9 and 10. And starting in verse 9, it says this, Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection, and outdo one another in showing honor. Those are the two verses we're going to look at. Right? So the first one is this, that, that we have to look at this call to separate. First things first, though. The, the book of Romans, we have to understand this. It's like seeking your teeth into a meaty, you know, maybe medium rare sirloin steak. It's full of savory truth. It's packed with uh, powerful realities about God and, and people and the gospel. You know, when you sink your spiritual mind into this book of Romans, you better be ready to chew slow so you really can uh, allow yourself to experience the satisfying realities of God and the gospel to fill your spiritual appetite. And so where do we need uh, to start in order to start this feasting on God's word in Romans. Specifically, this book of Romans was written to a group of Christians in Rome. And now Rome was dominated by a political system that hated Christians, persecuted Christians, did not like if you stood for Christ. They faced mass persecution. You may even remember a guy named Nero who, uh, these great fires in Rome that happened, he actually blamed the Christians for him just to give him a reason to go ahead and uh, mass persecute and kill these Christians, right? So this was a people Paul was writing to that were that were really having a hard time uh, living out their faith. Now there was also two groups of people that Paul was uh, including and writing to in this book: Jews and Gentiles. Now Jews, they were the people that God chose thousands of years ago to make as His own people. Some call them the people of promise. God promised that he would bless them, that he would make them as great as the number of the sands of the seashore. And through them, a great Messiah would come, a Savior would come to redeem and rescue these people. Do you think these people were looking for a rescuer at this point in their life, right? Being dominated by Rome, being persecuted, they were looking for this, this Savior. So the other group that we have going on here is the Gentiles. 
Now, the Gentiles, it was basically comprised of anyone who wasn't a Jew by birth or heritage, right? So up until this point in their story, though, the Jews and the Gentiles were not friends and they were not socially compatible. Right? Like They did not like each other. The Jews followed cleanliness laws that were set forward by the Old Testament laws. God gave them a set of rules to live by to set them apart from everyone else around them. And, and in doing so, he actually set them up to, to be healthy and, and uh, to live longer than all these other people. And so they followed a strict set of guidelines, and the Gentiles did not. And so they, they were not compatible. And so in this letter, Paul's writing to the Jewish Christians and the Gentiles amongst them. And, and Paul was, was called to deliver this great news that the, it, it, and so Paul was uh, called to deliver this great news of the gospel that God was not just about the promised people, the Jewish people anymore. God was about including the Gentiles into this great promise. Right? Like if I'm a Jew and, I, and I'm part of the promised people, I feel really special. And now God is saying, no, the Gentiles are now included in this promise. There can be a lot of tension there, right? A lot of conversations, hard conversations, understanding what does this really mean? And Paul was the guy to help bridge these two together. And so Paul is writing and saying, look, in Christ, we're all one. We're unified in Jesus now. There's not two groups anymore. We're now one. It, uh, Romans actually talks about how the Gentiles are grafted in. They're, they're brought in, and, and God has woven them into the promise. And so now everybody is one. And so Paul, in his letter in Romans, is outlining this to the people. And he's coming up to this point where he says, hey, there's this mystery of Israel's salvation. There's this mystery of these Jews and Gentiles coming together. And now, uh, as we're all living together in one body, in one unity in Christ, this is what this means to live together, right? And so then in chapter 12, he starts to lay out what does it really mean to live together in unity, even though we have our differences, and so we get to this point in, in chapter 12, verse 1, actually, if we go back, and he talks about living our lives as sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Now, sacrifices, just pause there for a second. I mean, you got to be asking the question, Paul, are, are you asking us to, like, you know, intentionally live in a way that's going to get us killed? Right? Because that's what sacrifices were all about. Right? They killed animals in place of of their sin, of their wrongdoing. So God would accept these sacrifices, these, these animals, and they would not, God would not judge the people, but he'd rather judge and, and take his wrath out on the animals. And so as Paul asking us to live in a way here where, where you know, we could potentially get killed. It's actually really interesting because Paul actually unpacks a little bit more for us uh, in, in verse 9 in our, in our passage. And so we're really looking at the making of this genuine love that God has shown us and wants us to show other people. So let's take a look at this again in verse 9. It says, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil. Okay, so here, this is what Paul's saying. Separate yourself. Genuine love for God and others is made up of this one part disgust, one part gospel, and one part sacrifice. Now, here's what I mean by that. I learned the word abhor is in, is in the verb form, meaning there's there's such disgust in one's heart for sin and for evil and for wickedness that a person chooses to literally separate themselves from evil, physically, emotionally, mentally. You make a literal decision to separate yourself from evil. Now, we got to pause here. Because this isn't a man-made effort that we can just conjure up and say, oh, I'm just going to not be a part of evil desires anymore the rest of my life, right? Like, because inherently, on our own, we cannot generate this. Because we have a hardwiring inside of us where the default is to pick sin. The default is to pick the wickedness every time. So what do we do? What, what must first come is a clinging to the gospel. You see, 
We have to separate ourselves. We have to have God do a work inside of us that creates such a disgust for evil and for wickedness that we want to distance ourselves. We want to completely separate ourselves from evil so we can cling to what is good. And this is the gospel. I love this word cling because there's a desperation in the word. If you think about a person clinging to something, right, there's a desperation. There's a, um, you know, all hope is lost unless I wrap my arms around, you know, this person or this safety net, right? Like there's a desperation when you cling to something. It's like your last hope. And for us, this is the gospel. The gospel is our hope. It's our only source of true life, abundant life. So the question is, is how desperate are we for the gospel? You know, if you're, you know, church-going people, or maybe you're on, you, you, you caught this message and, and you're not a church-going person, um, how desperate are we for the gospel? How depraved and helpless do we see ourselves being in the light of Christ? Or do we think that we're pretty good people, you know, who have most things together, but, you know, we just mess up here and there? Friends, if we are separating ourselves from sin, if we're disgusted with evil, then we have no other choice than to cling to the gospel, to the only hope that we have, which is Jesus. And I just want to lay out for you clearly what the gospel is. Here's the gospel that God created people perfectly, and he enjoyed a relationship with them. God created people perfectly to enjoy a perfect relationship with him, where they could give love and receive love back and forth perfectly. But people longed for God's power, and, and they, when tempted by Satan, they gave in and disobeyed God, because God told them not to eat of the tree of the, the knowledge of good and evil, where they become like God, and only between good and evil. There was a power that they were seeking, that they were hungry for. And so they wanted it more than they wanted that relationship with God. And so people sinned, and they brought imperfection into the relationship between them and God, and they brought brokenness, and they brought separation between them and God. But God never gave up on people, and he promised to send Jesus Christ, God the Son, in human form, to live the perfect, spotless, sinless life that we can never live, to take on the wrath and the condemnation and the death that we deserve, and to raise to life as the victor that he graciously gives us when we believe in his name. We become victors over sin, over death, and our relationship is restored with God when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. You see, when we taste victory, everything in the world that wants to distract and to, and to derail us, it turns into bland and disgusting experiences. Every day, we must bathe ourselves and bathe our spiritual minds in the gospel so our hearts are purified, our minds are transformed, and our wills are emboldened to do the will of God. That's what the gospel is, and that's what it does. It's an art, though. It takes practice. It takes repetition to learn that when we cling to our Savior, Jesus, he will never let us go. Every time a sinful desire lurks, every time a sinful thought wants to dominate our minds and, and, and turn our, our thoughts into, act, into sinful actions, every time those things happen, we, we cling to Jesus. We claim victory in Jesus. We claim the victory that Jesus has. Every time we're claiming this gospel, this good news, and we're practicing, we're reinforcing that when we cling to Jesus, that that is the best thing and that we're separating ourselves from the wickedness because Jesus is the best possible thing. And so the more that we experience this shielding, this protecting, this delivering, this love from God, we have God stirring up more and more a holy disgust 
where we want to be separated from sin because we are clinging to Jesus. You see, that's where the separation comes in. When we're clinging to Jesus, we're separating ourselves from sin and wickedness and evil. And so to live out this genuine love for God and others, we must first live as those who are clinging helplessly to the gospel. And since the gospel is the ultimate expression of genuine love, when we are clinging to this act of love, we can live this out with God and with others. And so I want to take a deeper look at this for a second. I want to take a look at the living out of genuine love. In verse 10, it says this, that love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Friends, to love God with a genuine love, is to love people with genuine love we first received. Now, what does genuine mean here? It means this simply, without motive. God didn't choose to love us because he wanted something in return. There wasn't a self-centered or self-promoting motive in his love for us. Rather, he chose to love us because that's who he is. So to live this genuine love out, we must first be receivers of this love, through the gospel so that we can overflow this motive-free love and kindness to others. Now, Paul gives us an example of this motive-free love and what it looks like. So he says this, outdo one another in honor, in showing honor. The driving force of loving people without motive is the goal of honoring them above yourself. You see, if the gospel is the well that you draw from, you will always have an overflowing amount of genuine, others-focused love to display. To love someone is to put someone ahead of yourself, to put them first rather than second or third or fourth. So next to God, we are to put others and their opinions and their feelings and their experiences all ahead of our own. Now, that's not to say you're less important, but when the gospel is your well, it's your source, you can't help but to lift up and to honor those around you more than yourself. So, what does this look like in church? What does living out motive-free, others-honoring love look like in a local church? Or maybe in your workplace, or in your homes, or in your neighborhoods? Here's a simple question to ask yourself the next time you're wondering if you're drawing from the gospel well versus the selfish well. Here's the question. Do I care more about satisfying myself than making this person feel respected and loved? Do I care more about satisfying myself than making this person feel respected and loved? It's going to play out in conversations, in decision-making, in our voting for church policies, in our neighborhood relationships, in your work relationships, maybe in your workplace conflicts that you're having. You face the dilemma every day to live genuine love amongst people. And my encouragement to you is just to pause, to reflect even on this past week. How many times did you respond in order to promote or advance your desires? How many times did you pick a fight because you were wanting to be validated and made felt right. Friends, living genuine, motive-free love all comes from the gospel. And it all comes when we are having God create such a disgust in us for evil and for selfishness in our lives that we can't help but cling to Jesus and watch as he transforms our very existence into a genuine life of loving the people the way that God has commanded us to love. So, In closing today, I want you to pause and I want you to seek the Lord out. Make some time to quiet your mind, quiet your heart. Ask him a few questions. Here's the first one. God, do I really believe that you're real? Do I struggle believing your word and what it says about sin and separation from you? Friends, if you have never taken the step to respond to God's calling on your life, to receive the gospel and the freedom of Christ. Now is the time. There's not a better time. God simply wants to hear your heart. He wants to hear that you admit that you have separated yourself 
from God by choosing to live a selfish life. And he wants you to believe that Jesus lived the perfect life that you could not live. As we admit that we've lived a life of selfishness that separates us from God, we believe that Jesus has lived the perfect life that we could not live. And we believe that Jesus died the death that we can never fully endure and we fully deserved because of our sin. And we believe that Jesus resurrected from the dead with eternal life for all who believe. And God wants us to confess now that we want Jesus to be the sole authority in our life from here on out. That you want Jesus to determine your steps and your path of life from here on out. And scripture promises that whenever anybody admits their sin, admits their selfishness and that separates them from God, and, and, and believes that Jesus is the one who has taken their place and holds eternal life. And when we confess that we want to follow Jesus into whatever he calls us, that he's our authority, friends, he promises to make you part of his family, his eternal family. So if that's you, man, communicate that with God. Share that with God. Pray those things to God right now. And he promises that you will be saved. And second, here's another question that, that you maybe need to ask yourself. God, what evil and sin do I need separation from? God knows your heart better than you do. Ask him for wisdom to know the sin and the evil that he needs to claim victory over in your life. Ask him to give you clarity and the faith to believe that in Christ you have the victory each and every day. So when you come up against those sins, when you come up against that selfishness, that you in the moment can claim the victory that Christ already has over those things. And you can walk in that freedom. You can walk in that love that God gives you and that you then can pass on to others. And lastly, maybe another question is this, God, what people do I need to love without motive? genuinely and willingly. You probably know the people, but allow God to remind you of those people or show you for the first time those people that need a fresh drink of gospel water that's filled with honor that only seeks to lift up those around you, even if it means passing on the things that you want. This teaching isn't easy, is it? It's not for the faint of heart. But my prayer is that God will use his word now to illuminate the beauty of Jesus and the power of the gospel to equip you with the perspective and the motivation to genuinely love God and to, to be loved by God so you can go on and love people with your whole heart. And in doing so, you can let your light shine before men that they may see your good works, your gospel works, and glorify your Father that's in heaven. Amen. Let me pray. God, thank you for your word. And I just pray that you would take it and bless those who are listening. Bless those who are watching. That they may see you. That they may follow you. That they may be loved by you. So they can go and love other people genuinely, wholeheartedly. As a result of the gospel working in them. And so we praise you and love you in Jesus' name.